Mr. LaPerry is first. Thank you very much for that introduction. Okay, so really what you've got here before you is not only three lawyers, but the past, present, and future of conflicts in Saskatchewan. I represent the past. I will speak about the report um, that I was involved in that prompted most of the changes to the current legislation that you're all dealing with now. The present, Neil Robertson, uh, was the acting Reeve of the RM, appointed to replace the Reeve who was removed from office by the government following the release of the report. And Mary McFadden represents the future about how conflicts will be handled in Saskatchewan. Uh, many of the recommendations made in the report have found their way into legislation, and Neil and Mary will discuss them in their speeches. In 20 minutes, I can't begin to cover what took months and months to investigate and report on. I will discuss the facts of the case as found by the Inquirer officer, Justice Ronald Barkley, the hearings, the findings, and the recommendations. First of all, this is the report. Uh, it is 178 pages in length and is available to the public and is available on your website for download. Now, just a show of hands, who's read it? Wow, that's pretty good. Uh, the report is a two-volume report, and only this volume is now uh, available. The second volume is all of the exhibits that were entered before the, uh, the inquiry. The report was authored by Ronald L. Barkley, a retired Queen's Bench judge who was well-suited for the task because he was at that time and still is the Conflicts Commissioner here in Saskatchewan uh, for members of the Legislative Assembly. He now, in addition to that position, is the Registrar of Lobbyists in the provinces, for the province of Saskatchewan under the new lobbyist legislation. I acted as Commission Counsel to Mr. Barkley, investigated the matter, and presented all the evidence before him. First of all, let's get oriented, and I hope you can all see this on the screen. I brought a laser pointer to point out what I was looking, uh, going to show you here, but it looks like I'm going to have to describe it a little bit. Let's get oriented uh, with the development, uh, the proposed Wascana Village development, which was the subject of this report. And to get you ori oriented, the proposed uh, Wascana Village was a development proposed as a residential subdivision for a population of 14,000 people over 736 acres, located a mile southeast of the city of Regina. In this photo, you can see the development's proximity to the city, landmarks such as the Ring Road, Wascana Golf Club, and former Plains Hospital, now the Sass Polytechnique. The land encompassed five quarter sections. One quarter section, the most northerly uh, to, the, to, the, to the west, the northwest quarter section, was a quarter section that was sold outright by the Reeve before anything started. It was sold to a developer. The quarter section, uh, north, uh, east quarter section, it's a partial quarter section, and that quarter section was owned by, um, and still is, I believe, owned by his cousin. So those two quarter sections were not owned by him directly. The other three quarter sections below that to the south were the three quarter sections that he sold under the various agreements described in the, uh, in the report. Uh, again, to orient you just a little further, you can see this is the development, sort of a horseshoe uh, development just, show, just south of the city of Regina. And in, in the middle of that horseshoe is a, uh, an area that was not sold as subject to the agreements. That was a full quarter section owned by the Reeve and a partial quarter section owned by his uh, cousin, which uh, becomes important in the report because it wasn't sold as part of the uh, agreement, but it was going to be developed as part of the agreement. And here's the concept plan for Wascana Village. And you can see it was going to be developed in, uh, and still might be developed in four different phases. The first phase, phase number one there, involved the quarter section that the Reeve completely sold and the half or a little bit more than 60% uh, uh, of a quarter section that was sold by his, uh, was owned by his cousin. So that's phase one, and that's important to uh, keep in mind that he did not have a pecuniary interest in that phase number one. Phase two, three, and four you can see in the other quarter, uh, 
quarter sections were the subject of his sale. Here you can see what was uh, proposed in a uh, preliminary uh, proposal for that area. There was going to be student housing. You can see a large area in the, the northwest quarter for that. Uh, water and sewage treatment plan was going to have to be uh, located there. High density residential along the north, northern corridor, uh, and commercial, and well, as well as residential lots and a green space. And again, the land ownership is shown here. Uh, you can see in the light, in the light blue, these are the, the, the phase one of, uh, of the development owned by the uh, developer outright and by, by a developer, not the developer that was uh, that entered into the agreement uh, with the REED, but a developer. And then the other partial quarter section owned by his, his cousin. And the three dark blue quarter sections are the ones owned by the REED. And the, the property that wasn't sold under the agreements I'm going to talk about is this, the, the center part of the horseshoe. Uh, these are what was, this is a very preliminary sketch of the estates at Wascana Village. And this was proposed by the Reeve and his cousin for the property immediately adjacent to the Wascana Village being large acre residential. Not an insignificant amount of the compensation the Reeve was to receive were commitments by the developer to improve this future development, including sewer and water connections and overall development of the area. Now, the subject property had challenges. Uh, it has an easement for the mainline transmission power line crossing the entire development. It had mainline easements for major pipelines traversing the property. And it had a pipeline pumping station. But the major obstacle the development faced was the lack of a water source, an obstacle that was not overcome at the time of this report. There were no major aquifers in the area, and the city declined to provide water to this area. Also, it had to develop sewer and water and treatment plan. So the hearings. Uh, the hearings. Barclay uh, was first appointed as an inspector on June the 16th, 2014, and after a brief inspection, determined that an inquiry was necessary. Why? Uh, this is because that an inspection under the Act you can uncover facts, that, but if you find facts that suggest that conduct might be called into question, you cannot cover that in an inspection. A, an inquiry must be ordered. Conduct cannot be made subject of an inspection, and an inquiry must be called if conduct is to be examined. So an interim report was issued on July 10, 2014, that recommended that an inquiry be called. The minister then ordered an inquiry on July 24 and an inquiry was commenced. An inquiry is not the equivalent of a hearing in court uh, before a judge. In court, the judge has wide powers and jurisdiction. In an inquiry, the powers and jurisdiction are significantly less. If the conduct of any person is going to be called into question in an inquiry, that person has to receive specific notice of what conduct is being called into question, all the documents that uh, that might affect a decision respecting that conduct, and they have uh, complete notice as to what the inquiry officer might find adversely in terms of their conduct. So all parties were required to produce documents, electronic records, and in this case, all emails had to be uh, produced, and these emails proved to be most insightful. For some of you who have read the report, you'll see the several of the adverse findings on credibility were based on those emails. Interviews were conducted of the witnesses, and the actual hearing took place from September 11th to November 19th, 2014. The hearing was not open to the public. 14 witnesses testified, and hundreds of exhibits were entered. The report was issued on December 30th, 2014, and then what followed was the removal of the Reeve uh, from his position. By the, federal, by the provincial government. Now, the findings are as follows, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pay close uh, uh, adherence to the report. On May 7, 2012, the RM was first contacted by the developer. Two days later, council voted to have the development included in the RM's official plan. 
no cost-benefit analysis, no diligence on the developer, no diligence on the project itself. And I quote from the report, quote, the RM had never in its history considered a proposal for a high-density residential development of this magnitude, but in a matter of hours, without any study or professional report from their staff, they were behind the proposal, end of quote. The official community plan was later amended to redesignate the land from agricultural to residential land. The whole proposal, of course, had to be approved by the provincial government. And so let's look at the agreements that the, the, the REV entered into. And here you'll see um, what, what was the issue before the inquiry officer. The first agreement was dated May, the 12, May, May of 2012, and the sale was subject to the purchaser satisfying himself that all approvals could be given, and the sale never closed. In that case, the Reeve declared a pecuniary interest and left the room. Using those words, I have a pecuniary interest, I'm leaving the room. A second agreement was entered into in September of 2012 called an extension agreement. In this agreement, $1.4 million was to be paid if the land was rezoned by the provincial government. Approval was obtained. So for the first time, the Reeve had an interest that could only be fulfilled by the provincial government actually rezoning the property. Again, the Reeve declared a pecuniary interest, but all the act required on the face of the act was to say, I've got a pecuniary interest. And that's all that was said. In April of 2013, a new sales agreement was entered into. This time, it was subject to rezoning being approved and added that it gave a 6% net profit interest over the entire development. So now you've got not only a sale of the property, conditional on rezoning, you have a 6% interest over all five quarter sections. And lastly, two agreements were entered into in November of 2013. A sales agreement um, that was subject to rezoning and an, a separate profit sharing agreement over the entire development with 10% um, of the prop, net profit being available, estimated to be about $40 million. So you can see the escalating involvement throughout all of these agreements. And the declaration before council was, I have a pecuniary interest and played no part in uh, matters that came before council. What were the findings of the, uh, Mr. Uh, Justice Barkley? Number one, the Reeve only ever simply declared, I have a pecuniary interest and left council. He provided no details, details whatsoever on what that interest was. The game changer, according to Mr. Barkley, Judges Barkley, occurred when the Reeve entered into a contract that would see him not only sell his land, conditional on rezoning, but share profits with the developer over all lands, including lands not owned by him. Still, counsel was not told. Mr. Barkley found that outside counsel chambers, the Reeve was actively involved in directing staff and the direction of the RM in pursuit of the development, getting approval from the provincial government, and most importantly, seeking a water source for the development. The act at that time simply called for the Reeve to declare a pecuniary interest and leave the room and absent himself. Mr. Barclay found that not only the act applied, but also the common law and the oath of office that the Reeve took. He found as follows, he made, he made reference to, to an inquiry that was called in Mississauga in 2011 regarding the mayor of Mississauga at that time, who have, who, whose son was involved in a development in the city. Um, and the mayor had at that time declared uh, that she had a pecuniary interest and didn't vote on anything. But behind the scenes, she was working to promote that development. Justice Cunningham wrote in that report as follows, and I'm re re referring to page 78 of the report. Justice Cunningham's report expressly rejected Mayor McCallion's very narrow and technical reading of the requirements contained in their applicable statutory provisions. Quote, 
I find Mayor McClellan, McClellan's narrow view of her duties in the face of a conflict of interest troubling. The Mayor's position throughout the inquiry was that her conduct in the face of a conflict of interest posed by her son's pecuniary interests should be assessed only with regard to the provisions of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. The judge, judge found, I find that the mayor was mistaken in, his, in, in this belief. Specifically, I find that whether the mayor's conduct was appropriate in the face of the real conflict of interest must be assessed with regard not only to the Conflicts of Interest Act, but also as to the common law of conflict of interest. Justice Barclay, at page 78 of his report, said this. It is apparent that the common law as it relates to conflict of interest applies and runs concurrently with the applicable provisions of the Act. The type of conduct prohibited under, under the common law regarding conflicts of interest is more expansive than that prohibited by the Act. And some of you must be saying, well, what is this common law? Here it is. Furthermore, the common law is concerned not only with steps taken by a member of council with respect to their legislative role on council, but it also prohibits a member of council from participating in any activity that could reasonably be seen as preferring their own private interests ahead of the interests of their voters of the municipality as a whole. Justice Barclay went on to say, the act merely provides a procedural code for how pecuniary interests must be addressed when they arise in council chambers. In contrast, the common law encompasses a range of conduct that would appear inappropriate to a reasonable observer. There's the test. Would it be inappropriate to a reasonable observer who would at the same time be unable to point to a specific section in the act prohibiting the same conduct? As alluded to my report, the common law is little more than common sense in that it requires the avoidance of self-interested dealings. In this case, the Reeve had a legal opinion that told him that once he sold his land subject to approval by the government, he had to disclose that to council and have no further involvement in the development in council chambers and outside of council chambers but he did not follow that legal advice. What were the recommendations the report gave? They were as follows. One, members should be required to state the nature of their pecuniary interest. At that time, all the law required was to say, I have a pecuniary interest. So now details have to be given. Two, a private disclosure statement should be filed each time a member declares a pecuniary interest. And you can see why that uh, recommendation was made. In this case, the Reeves' interest escalated from really having no interest under the first agreement to having an interest in rezoning, to having it, and further agreements to having an interest in rezoning, to having an interest in the overall development. Three, the common law and conflict of interest should be expressly uh, recognized in the legislation. And I know my friend, Mr. Robertson will be talking about that. A model code of ethics should be developed and adopted. Five, a conflict of interest commissioner should be set up for municipalities, and there she sits. <laughs> the ombudsman will uh, fill, fulfill many of those recommendations. Following the release of the report, the, remove, uh, the Reeve was removed from office and replaced by the gentleman who will speak to you next, Mr. Neil Robertson, so I turn it over to him. Thank you, uh, Councillor O'Donnell, for uh, the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about the new rules that, that all of you will be obliged to follow. And essentially, I mean, this is the most significant change in the law with respect to conflict of interest since 1984, when the Urban Municipality Act was enacted. And it's, it's worth remembering that before that time, if you had a contract with the municipality you couldn't serve on council. So the change at that time was intended to let more people serve on council, especially people who, business people that might have dealings with the municipality, to get the benefit of their experience, their wisdom, 
but set in place reasonable rules that would require them to avoid any conflict of interest. I mean, that was the change in, in 84. And I say it's always good to remember that because at one time, it could be that some of you simply couldn't serve. You could be a complete bar to serving on council. So I want to talk about why the new rules. And I really don't have to spend much time on that because Mr. LaPrairie has explained that. I'll talk about what stays the same because essentially the regime uh, stays the same in many respects. What's new and then uh, talk about enforcement of the rules, although really that will fall to Ms. McFadden. So Mr. LaPrairie's explained. Uh, the Orm of Sherwood, if you, if you want to thank any uh, one body for the new rules, you can thank the Orm of Sherwood. And the result of the report, as he said, was the immediate consequence was removal of the Reeve, placing the RRM under administration, uh, and appointing a Reeve, which ended, that administration ended essentially in, in December. But the other one of more consequence for you is the enactment of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Amendment Act, which was enacted November 19th, 2015. So what stays the same? Well, the essential rule remains disclose and, and depart. If you have what was then a pecuniary interest, now a conflict of interest, if you have a conflict, you have to declare it, you have to leave the council chamber, and more than that, you can't take any part in discussion either before, during, or after, uh, that would influence other members of council. So pretty, pretty simple and reasonable rule. The other rule is the public disclosure statement, but that only applied to cities and to municipalities that chose to adopt it. And the public disclosure statement requires uh, members of council to essentially document their property interests in the municipality or neighboring municipality and any business interests. So essentially list items that may well become a, a matter of, of conflict. So what's new? Well, there's lots that's new. In terms of the conflict of interest, before it was simply referred to a pecuniary interest, a financial interest. As Mr. LaPrairie has explained, what was really important in the report, and it's a, you can find that elsewhere, but what's important is Mr. Barclay essentially said, well, you have these procedural rules for members of council, but that's not it. There's also the common law that applies and has always applied, and I agree with that. So what the legislature has essentially done is is in expanding the conflict of interest in the statute, it's simply importing the common law uh, into the statute, which is a good thing because it's, it's clearer, it's easier for you to read. And in terms of the, the expansion of conflict of interest, it's broader than financial. And we may have to wait and see with decisions, uh, with reports coming from from the Ombudsman decisions of the court as to exactly what, what that means. But I mean, I'll repeat again the quote that uh, Mr. Perry had from Mr. Barclay's report, that the common law is little more than common sense in that it means the avoidance of self-interested dealings. Mr. Perry also referred to the test of, is it inappropriate to a reasonable observer? I mean, essentially, I'd, I'd say that we call that in common parlance, it's the smell test. Uh, it, it, so this isn't something that's really complex. Most of it, us can, can know it when we see it, although it's often difficult to see it for ourselves. I'm going to come back to this, but I just sort of note that number of the changes. Duties of councillors is revised, adding duty of confidentiality. There will be a new oath of office. The model code of ethics will be prescribed. Uh, also has to be adopted by members of council. The public disclosure statement will apply to all municipalities. Uh, amendments are required to the council procedure bylaw. There will be a requirement for an employee code of conduct. The minister's powers are enhanced. Uh, the provincial ombudsman jurisdiction now applies to municipalities. A uniform disqualification period of 12 years. And some changes with respect to planning requiring cost-benefit analysis. Now, I went through that really quickly, so I'm going to come, come back to that in terms of, for councils, as a body, what do you have to do? Well, as of the date of enactment, the conflict of interest rules apply. So those rules apply now 
to all of you. It's not just a matter of declaring a pecuniary interest. Uh, if you have a conflict of interest, which is broader, in, in effect, if you'd be promoting your own interest or the interests of someone close to you, family member, your spouse, dependent child, a business interest, then you have to declare it, you have to uh, do more than what, what was required previously. The public disclosure statements are now required. And that requires uh, employment, business and property holdings of the member, the spouse and dependent children. And for, this is for council but for administrators too, there will be a bit of a learning curve but ensure that that declaration because I, I always say that it has to be in the minutes and that's really a responsibility of, of the head of council, uh, the mayor or Reeve, uh, the administrator, <coughs> the clerk, but it's a personal responsibility. It's your responsibility to see that the declaration's there and that it's sufficient, that it, it explains not only that you made the declaration but the nature of, of the declaration. And you also have to then put that in, in your own uh, public disclosure statement. Council has to adopt, and that's by January 19th, it's just passed. However, if you haven't done it, uh, you can extend that by 90 days, but Council has to adopt or more likely amend your procedure bylaw to address uh, items including conflict, or conduct of members, confidentiality, delegations, and closed meetings. And there's essentially uh, the statute rules apply. You also have to adopt an employee code of conduct, which is essentially setting up more likely the same type of rules with respect to conflict of interest, but you might have other rules with respect to, to conduct in, in there. In terms of what is to come still, uh, the Ministry is consulting with SUMA and with SARM. There will be a new oath of office that will have to be sworn once it's, it's ready. And uh, there will be a model code of ethics which has to be incorporated into, into the uh, council bylaw. But if, it, if they don't, then it applies regardless. So as individuals, again, coming back to the conflict of interest, it applies to any private interest which is, is a broad interest, but the exceptions in the Act still apply. Matters like common interest. Uh, but the basic rule is as was before, disclose and depart. But it has to be a full disclosure. So you have to explain enough that other members of council and the recording clerk understands what the nature of it is, what exactly you're declaring. Now in the past two, and I saw this, sometimes people would just avoid the meeting or leave the room. So they wouldn't make any declaration, it would just take the view, well, I, I didn't participate in the vote, so I'm not in the conflict. That's no longer allowed. Okay. If you're not there, you have to still make the declaration at the next meeting, basically when you return. And if you don't, you're in, in breach. And that's a good change uh, to ensure that there is a record of this. You also have to amend your public disclosure statement. So it's not only in the minutes, but you've got to then uh, go to your public disclosure statement and, and put in that you made this, this uh, declared this private interest and explain what it is. And the public disclosure statement will be done when, when members are elected, has to be updated annually, and as I say, every time uh, a conflict is declared. So, what stays the same? The Minister still has the power to order uh, an audit, an inspection or an inquiry. Still has the power to appoint a person to supervise the municipality, used to refer to administrator, now supervisor. And Lieutenant Governor Council, essentially Cabinet, can remove any member of Council. Both Council and any ratepayer still have, any elector still have the right to bring an application uh, seeking disqualification of someone who's breached the rules and is required to resign but hasn't. And that was really viewed as kind of the main enforcement mechanism. But whenever people would, would call me, uh, I would frankly discourage them from taking that because there can be an, quite a significant cost to that. Uh, Mr. LaPrairie mentioned the uh, inquiry in Mississauga, which involved uh, the mayor there. Well, an individual brought an application, in that case to have the mayor removed, was ultimately unsuccessful, and uh, Mayor McCallion sought legal costs of close to $400,000 
was only awarded $170,000, but uh, gives you an example of sort of the cost that can be incurred. Well, that can obviously discourage an individual from bringing an application, even if they feel there's, there's good reason. So in terms of what's new, well, uh, the provincial ombudsman. And in my view, this is really uh, overdue. So the ombudsman now has the ability not only to look at issues of conflict of interest of members of council, but to investigate a wide range of complaints against municipalities. And the ombudsman's office has always had that with respect to provincial agencies and, and the province uh, on the executive branch, but not municipalities. And it seemed, always seemed reasonable to me that, uh, that they should have that power. So that's something that's done. As I mentioned, the minister's powers are in, enhanced. Essentially some fine tuning there, learning from this experience. And previously in the act, depending on, on who took the action, there were different disqualification periods. And in the case of where cabinet removed someone, there was no disqualification period. So that's been replaced with a uniform disqualification period across the statutes of 12 years. So a very significant penalty if someone is removed from council. Just to say one thing that wasn't done, uh, and, I, and I say too, I agree with all of the amendments. I think they're, they're good amendments uh, to the legislation, but uh, Mr. Barkley had recommended a municipal conflict of interest commissioner with uh, jurisdiction in two respects. One, to give advice to individual members of council, and the other to investigate complaints. Now, essentially, that wasn't acted on specifically, but the province in giving jurisdiction to the ombudsman to investigate dealt with that part of it and that was the the most important part of it but as i mentioned sort of at the start it's easy to see a conflict with someone else it's often easy to see you're difficult to see a conflict that we're engaged in ourselves so i have some sympathy for individual members of council and in, in how do i know if i'm in a conflict Let's say, uh, often if you just talk to other members of council, they can, can advise you that can be a good thing. But, but uh, I do think uh, Summa Sarm and the ministry, there's steps that can be taken uh, through things like this, through public education, to help individual members of council. Councils might want to consider uh, in the powers of remuneration, uh, providing allowances so that members can seek independent advice because no one wants to see a member removed simply because they, they uh, misunderstood the application of, of the rules. So those are things, that, but really that's the only aspect I can see that wasn't, wasn't addressed and that, as I say, I think Summa Sarm and the ministry, that's something that they can, can think about, but public education goes a long ways, but there may be other, other ways to, to deal with that. You know, I've always said with this, essentially as members of council, you hold a public trust. And as trustees then, and I'm sure all of you understand and accept this, your private interests become secondary to the public interest, which is essentially when you make decisions at council, you do what's best for the community, but that's why all of you are serving. So uh, while this, there'll be some learning with this, uh, I'd say these are good changes, and this will improve the situation. And, and maintain uh, the high degree of faith that there is in our democratic institutions at the municipal level. So thank you, I'll turn it over to Mary now. So here we are, the future. So what to, where do we go from here now that the Legislative Assembly has made all these changes through the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? So that's what I'm here to talk about. So now that the Act has passed, so as of November 19th, um, our, our jurisdiction has been expanded to include receiving complaints about municipal entities and council members. So this may mean that you will get a call from the ombudsman as in the course of your business. So what my goal today is just to let you know like what is an ombudsman, what do they do, how do they do it, and so that when you get a call from us it won't be as scary as one might think. So anyway, so this is what an ombudsman is. So we are a public official that we are appointed with the authority to receive and investigate complaints. And if appropriate, we investigate and we make recommendations in order to fix the issue. 
we have the ability to make anything public that we wish to if we think it's in the public interest. So in Saskatchewan, we have the Ombudsman's Act 2012, which appoints the Ombudsman, and all of our powers and duties are set up in that. Um, and we receive complaints about provincial government services, and it's not uncommon for provincial ombudsmen to have the power to review the municipal entities. There's, of, out of the nine, 10 provinces, nine have a provincial ombudsman, PEI doesn't. Uh, and there's three other provinces, BC, Manitoba, Ontario, and New Brunswick, uh, have jurisdiction over municipal entities. Um, we have probably the most municipal entities of anybody. For example, Ontario, they just have 440. We have 780. And just to let you know, when Ontario brought in their legislation, they gave them eight months to ramp up. So the legislation passed back in May, and they started taking complaints on January the 11th. And we didn't have that luxury. November 19th, our doors opened, and we really started receiving complaints about municipal entities immediately. So we are, under the legislation, we're responsible to the Legislative Assembly. We are not accountable to any of the government ministries or to any minister or to the Premier. We're separate and apart from the provincial government that provides all the services to government. And so our role is, as an appointed, as an officer of the Legislative Assembly, my role is to make sure and to assist the Legislative Assembly, make sure that the government is carrying out its services fairly and timely and in a public interest to all of its citizens. So as I mentioned before, for, we've been around since 1973 and we've had jurisdiction over pretty much every provincial organization or provincially funded organization. And we had that count, we counted them up, there's about 209 uh, ministries, crowns, agencies, boards, those type of things. And as of November 19th, our jurisdiction expanded to 780 municipal and municipalities and 30, there's 3,700 council members. So it's quite a big expansion of our mandate. So this is the definition of municipal entity under the Act. It's very wide. It includes the municipality under all of the three acts and uh, council, council committee, or anything established by council. Council member also includes any council member, mayor or reeve, any council committee or anything established by a council. So it's very wide. So what can we investigate? Uh, so the act sets out what our powers and duties are. And with respect to matters of administration, we can investigate any decision, any recommendation made by an organization that's under our jurisdiction. And so that includes a municipal municipality and a council member. And we can investigate any act that was done or admitted to be done by the organization in the exercise of any power, any duty, any function conferred or imposed on them by any of the acts. And this includes a council member and any matter with respect to a conflict of interest or alleged contravention of a code of ethics. So also we have the power to investigate matters on their, our own motion. Uh, we don't necessarily have had to receive a complaint before we can investigate something. Uh, very rarely we would do that. Lots of times if we get a complaint about a certain issue from a bunch of people, the, and if it's important that nobody be identified because it's, it just would be bad to identify people that had complained, that's usually when we'll do it as, a, as an own motion. So our process generally is, again, we're not part of government and we are not uh, an advocate for a complainant who brings a complaint to our office. We are neutral and impartial. We do not take sides. We carry out our duties in an independent and impartial manner. Um, we also have a duty to conduct our investigations in private. So in general, we do not discuss complaints. Uh, we're not a court. Uh, when we do an investigation, we make recommendations. We don't have any order power. Uh, we're not elected officials. So. We do not campaign for social change or question if, if a bylaw is properly enacted. That's not our role. But our role is to make sure that when council or municipalities are carrying out their duties, that they're done so in a fair, impartial, and in a public interest manner. So it's also important that we're an office of last resort. So an ombudsman's role is to make sure that all everybody's administrative practices are working properly. So we will refer people back to a process if there is one there. So if uh, there is a process within your municipality um, 
or the person hasn't tried to work it out or phone the administrator, we will refer them back there first because we want to know what steps they've taken themselves to look at it. Because really, every organization should be allowed to fix their own problems without someone like me getting involved. So we will refer them back to do that step first. We also really have wide discretion. We can investigate anything and no one can tell us what to investigate and we can decline to investigate if we think it's something that we should not be investigating. So when someone comes to our office, we will, again, like I said, refer them back if they haven't uh, dealt with the complaint. Lots of times we'll tell people how to complain, what things they should have when they go to talk to somebody so that they can deal with the problem themselves. Um, so, but because we're new at it now, there's lots of stuff we don't know about how municipalities work or how their complaint processes work if they have them. So right now you may have been getting calls from my office just seeking information about, you know, uh, what the processes are, what they should be doing if, because someone's called about a service in your organization. So um, you might have had calls already. We do figure out if it's within our jurisdiction. Some, lots of times people phone and it's not within our jurisdiction. And then we look to see if have they tried to deal with the matter themselves. And if there's processes in place, we refer them back. And if not, then we will look at it ourselves. So when someone contacts us, the first thing we do, okay, is it within our jurisdiction? What's he done to look at it? Okay, he's already tried the processes that municipalities have in place. So then we'd look to see if it was something that we could maybe resolve. And out of 80% of the cases that we get a year, and we get about 3,000 cases a year, we are able to resolve them within one or two or three phone calls. Lots of times it's people aren't able to explain what their issue is or they haven't dealt with the right people. There's a lack of communication, and so we deal with most of our cases that way. So this is, you will probably, this is probably in most cases, you will not know if you've received a complaint, if we've received a complaint about your municipality until this stage because if it's a stage where they haven't gone back to you or tried to work it out with you first we'll refer them back but if it's something where they've already tried that then this is probably when you would hear from us first of all and we'd be phoning to ask questions about you know to see if what the complainant has told us is accurate and if there's anything that can help resolve the issue so then if we can resolve it that's great if we can't resolve it then we'll look at whether or not we should actually investigate and we, when we investigate, our act says we have to provide written notice. So if it's a complaint about an administrative action that a municipal entity has gone, then it would go to the administrative head, which would be the administrator. If it's a complaint about a council member or a council committee, then it is, we would give notice to the mayor or reeve. And if it's a complaint about the mayor or reeve's actions, then we give notice to the minister. So once we investigate, we try to get all the facts, we make sure are the appropriate laws and policies, what are they, have they been followed, and we determine whether or not the complaint is founded. So as I mentioned before, we conduct our complaints, our investigations in private. We have very wide powers of investigation. Uh, we are able to get any information, documents, we can enter on any premises, we can subpoena if required. Uh, it's an offense to lie to the ombudsman during an investigation. And that said, in 40 years of the office been running, I think there was one time probably 25 years ago that a subpoena had to be issued. Most people cooperate and the act provides that you can voluntarily give information to the ombudsman. So it's very rare that we would ever have to subpoena somebody uh, to get information from them. And as I mentioned, we conduct our investigations in private. However, we do under the Act, we can disclose information at the end of an investigation if we think it's in the public interest to do so. So now, we're really when we say, okay, what, how do we decide what's fair? Because we always look at the, if things are fair or not. And it's a little bit like, as Neil said, the test about what would a reasonable person think in that situation. And so we sort of look at different types of fairness. How were people treated? Um, was their confidentiality respected? What was the process that was used? Was the person who made the decision unbiased? Uh, did someone get notice if they should have that a decision was going to be made against their interest? Did they have an opportunity to make comments? Uh, did they have an opportunity to challenge the information? Were proper reasons given so the person could understand a decision or an action that was made against them? We also look at the substantive side of fairness. 
So did the, per did the organization or the person have the legal authority to make the decision? Was the decision correct in law? Was it based on a reasonable assessment of facts or was it based on wrong information? So that's sort of an example of the type of things that we look at when we get a complaint. And then after we get a complaint, we investigate, we analyze the facts, and we determine whether or not the decision was unjust, discriminatory, based on bad information, contrary to law, made for an improper purpose, or it was fair. Sometimes we review things and they have been treated fairly, but sometimes we do and they're not. So then once we've done our investigation, then we report. We set out our findings and investigation report. What we would do then is send it to anybody that was affected by it. So we never ambush anybody. If we are going to make recommendations that would adversely affect somebody or are aimed at an organization, we give them a copy before we make it final so that they have an opportunity to comment on it and uh, make representations about any information that we have in our, our thing. So that's what we would do first. Because our goal is if we're going to investigate something and make recommendations, we really want the, the recommendations to help the organization that we're investigating so that other people don't find themselves in the same situation. So it's always our goal and we never want to ambush anybody. And again, we would then make recommendations and we only make recommendations. We are not a court. We can't order anybody to do anything. But because we do good investigations, in most cases, our investigations are, our recommendations are followed by government organizations. Um, I think in 2014, we issued 32 recommendations. Only two of them were not accepted by the organization. Uh, we listened to their considerations, but we still thought they were important, so we, we kept them. So, um, for our reporting, we publicly report annually to the Legislative Assembly on what we've done during the year, and we also can issue public reports on any matters that we think it is important to do so. So it's our discretion whether or not we're going to take an individual investigation report and make it public. Uh, sometimes we would do it if, there's, if the issue's been in the public domain, or if there's incorrect information in the public domain that needs to be corrected, and if there's an expectation on the part of government or the public that our investigation would be made public. So anyway, so the way forward, so now we have this jurisdiction. So just so from November the 19th, just so that you have an idea of how many complaints we've got, from November the 19th to January the 22nd, we received 60 complaints about municipalities and council members. So of those 60, 24 dealt with council member <coughs> conduct. So we've got a big... Uh, a big task ahead of us, I think. So it's we will be contacting you to get information about um, your organizations a lot, so bear with us. Uh, we've really tried to reach out because we know it's important that you understand what we do, and it's also important for us to understand what your challenges are. So I know we've already contacted everybody by mail. We sent a letter out in, I think, late November just saying that we had jurisdiction. Uh, we've sent out I think we did a bunch of, we sent out a bunch of brochures and everything last week. And we're going to have information sessions for council members, uh, any employees or officials that are interested in how, how we do our work, what we mean when we say administrative fairness and how to improve your services to citizens. And so we'll be trying to do that. We're thinking of doing webinars so that everybody can participate. Um, and we'll try to do those probably in the next couple of months. So. Anyway, that's a little bit about uh, what we're going to do. Um, so there we go. Okay. Very good. So we have a microphone uh, just over to my uh, right over here. So if you have a question, I'd appreciate it if you would go over there and stand up. And uh, while I'm doing that, not only does he have AV technology, but I want to make sure you introduce uh, one of our staff. He happens to be our legal counsel. He might be not a person that you see all the time. So if I get just Stephen, just Stephen, the AV guy, but also the lawyer as well for Suma. So if you don't mind. Thank you. So uh, are there some questions, please, if you would come forward? Thank you, ma'am. If you don't mind, just speak right into the microphone. 
Hello, my name is Nicole Monchin. I'm the administrator for the town of Grenfell. I have a question regarding the uh, disclosure statements. So uh, once a council member has filled out and submitted their disclosure statement or has updated their disclosure statement, is there any requirement for that statement to be recorded in the minutes? Mr. Robertson, I think. Uh, no, not in the minutes of council, but the public disclosure statement usually is kept in, in the minister's office or the clerk's office and is available you know, during normal hours to members of the public. So, however, uh, in terms of council, it's a, generally when members are elected, they'll, they'll complete the statement for the first time then, and then each year they're required to update it, so the administrator should be bringing it to their attention probably even at the same time update it but the other change is that every time a member of council declares a conflict of interest that's recorded in the minutes but they also have to then go to that public disclosure statement and amend it to put in the, essentially the same information except here they're putting it in writing and the advantage of that is is then you know at council you're making the statement and you're relying on the clerk to get it right and of course you review it in the minutes but it'll be there but it also has to be then put in the public disclosure statement which essentially might seem like a duplication but ensures that that you've got what the member thinks is is their conflict recorded there so what they're supposed to do is write like on the back of the public disclosure statement that on January 2nd I counselor Smith declared a conflict of interest regarding my wife and the swimming pool is that what they're supposed to put on that I mean even if they have the swimming pool listed as a potential conflict on their statement already yes okay thank yeah. you I, and, and I think the, the probably the expectation is that while sometimes it'll already refer to something on there, it might be something new that's come up, and that's why they've, they've, they have to add it. But, but you know, even if it, if it results in duplication, it's to ensure that everything's above board. Any member of the public can come in and look at this, and, and they, they know that uh, the member has removed themselves and has declared it fully. Thanks for that question, sir. The microphone is yours. Uh, Murray Connor Duke from Town of Strasbourg, Councillor. I'll direct this to the on uh, We're asking for information from a municipal identity, which is a landfill identity. On uh, we'd like uh, the financial statements and some more information. How long do we have to wait for that statement to come? And what is is this uh, uh, an issue that we can bring to you? We, we would look at any administrative action or decision that a municipal, municipal entity had done. So anything that they done and if someone feels they've been aggrieved by that action or decision or omission, those are the type of things that we would look at. So whatever you said you were asking for, whatever it says under the Act uh, that they have to provide it, if they haven't provided it, then those are the type of things we would look at. Well, at this present time, there's absolutely no communication back and forth. It's only one direction. So probably if, if it's an issue that, it's probably something that you should contact, phone our office, and the people that work on our intake section can make sure that they've got the right information, and then we can see if it's something we can deal with. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Microphone is yours. Tina Cresswell, Maple Creek. I ask stupid questions. Um, I would like to know, our council, of course, is extremely uh, um, eager to comply, and I think perhaps a little overzealous. I would like to know about payment of accounts. We have councillors whose spouses are routinely paid for certain services that they perform for the community. These Councillors do not sign the check requisitions, but uh, do they need to leave the room when the counts are paid? Neil, do you want to try that? Yes, and, and this comes up before, you know, and other times, and I've always told, there's a couple ways you can deal with it. One, if, if an account's required to be uh, paid under contract, uh, then 
I always question, well, why is council approving it as opposed to simply receiving notice of, of that these, the administrator has made these payments pursuant to contracts? You know, so I always question, well, why actually have council approve them? Because essentially, uh, if you've given the administrator the authority to pay them, and if it's pursuant to a contract, they're just paid. Uh, but if council has decided to approve them the other way around, that is, simply remove those accounts where you know there's an ongoing conflict and deal with them separately. So in, in effect, bring forward all the accounts, which is normally how it's done, approve them at, at once, and then bring forward uh, those individual ones that you know one or two councillors uh, may have a conflict and they can declare it, and leave room and, and deal with that. So there's, there's, I mean, there's practical ways to deal with this without, without removing an individual member from review of any of the counts. Although, as I say, I always question kind of, if you're just bringing forward for information, that, that doesn't create a conflict. It's the approval that would create the conflict. That's right. And also things like uh, reimbursement of expenses and that kind of thing, I think, are administrative. They're not... They're not, they don't need to come to council. However, we do pay the accounts at council with a motion. Yeah, I mean, it's it, like I always think it is good in terms of openness of government to have this, this information there because then everyone knows what's been, been paid. But I always view that that's simply an administrative report coming forward as opposed to, you know, my question is why ask council to do something which, frankly, your administrator should be simply reporting, I've paid these accounts uh, and I'm just bringing this forward for your information. So. If any member of the public is interested, or if you have a question, uh, it, it's you know you can deal with it there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The microphone is yours. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Bob Hawkins. I'm a counselor for the city of Regina. I'd like to thank the panel for a very interesting exposition of a very complex subject. My concern is not with the easy cases. I think that everybody understands that uh, uh, conflict of interest needed to be paid attention to. My concern is with the difficult cases. What, um, and I'm concerned about the 12-year sanction, actually. What about the situation in which the language of conflict of interest or the substantive uh, understanding of what amounts to a conflict of interest is vague, uh, and a counselor is exposed to that kind of incertitude when he or she has to make a decision? What about the situation where conflict of interest rules are abused by, say, an opponent on counsel that wants to tie up uh, another counselor? What about a situation in which a, a counselor with, of modest means suddenly finds him or herself in the position of having to get expensive legal help to get out of a conflict of interest uh, problem? All of those situations could put a chilling effect on the operation of our democratic process and moreover cause a reluctance of good people, well-meaning people, to put their name forward on counsel.